Kuala Lumpur is a classic example of how rapacious modern development can be. There can be no progress without growth, and growth devours the land. The Orang Asri's ancestral lands have become an extremely valuable resource for the needs of a modern world. Kuala Lumpur's new international airport covers a hundred square kilometers of territory. A multi-billion dollar symbol of Malaysia's ambition to be the air traffic hub of the region, it has already been a great financial success for those who designed and built it. For the Orang Asli community that used to occupy Runway 1 and who were forced to relocate, it has been an unmitigated disaster. If we were Malay, Chinese or Indians, they would follow the rules of land payment. They have land titles. They have rights. We too have rights. We are Malaysian citizens too, but our land, we don't have. But this is a misconception among, among Orang Asli. Uh, they seem to consider uh, the place uh, where they are staying as their ancestral land or Tanasaka. But uh, this uh, claim uh, is not recognized by, by the National Land Code. So uh, th there's always this conflict uh, between uh, the so called Tanasaka and uh, so National Land Code. Uh, in actual fact, uh, the, the places where they stay are actually state land. This is where they live now. Whenever there, there's a government move to, to take their land, they honestly tend to ask for common uh, for the uh, market value of the land. Um, but the, the operation of the law enables only or actually to get the compensation based on what they have planted on the on the land but not the, the actual land and the proper land if you had no trees you didn't get one cent there were three or four people who didn't get one cent they wept they were promised new land with title deeds planted with fruit trees and rubber and oil palm before they moved in, they were told. Each family would receive a cash subsidy of $45 a month for five years to tide them over till their new trees fruited. After seven years, this is what they have. These oil palms are the only trees that have materialized. It will be years before these fruit. They weren't given as much land as they were promised. The cash subsidy has already dried up, and legally, they're still squatters. In the case of Busuk Baru, uh, I mentioned, um, well, it's the wrong choice of, of land for the resettlement. If uh, the land allocated for them were better, eh, dry land uh, cultivate, uh, can be cultivated easily, without having to spend money for drainage, then um, the story could be, could, be di could be different. In our opinion, being relocated was a tragedy. We're worse than poor now. We're worse off than during the Japanese occupation, which lasted three years and eight months. Why? Because now we have no work. Batin Sinin spent years complaining to the Orang Asli department before anyone paid attention. I went there three times. I had a discussion with them and uh, discussed with the, you know, uh, the implementing, uh, implementing agencies, JKR, DID, FACRA and so on. We are taking steps to, you know, to improve the, the law. Because what happened in the past, uh, you know, that, that was what happened. You know, the choice of land or whatever. So we'll try to, you know, to give a better, better deal for them. What happened to Batin Senin's village is not uncommon. The people of this community ran away from their resettlement area and returned to the jungle. 
to start from scratch. The role of the GOA is not uh, to do what they are mandated to. That means to take care of their well-being, progress and advancement. It's a means to control the orang asli, you know, and to, to uh, advocate the interests of the government when it comes to orang asli government disputes. And this is what they've done all this time. In such circumstances, it isn't hard to see how a whole way of life, an entire culture, can be systematically destroyed. It's going to cause a lot of social structural breakdowns. It's going to cause, uh, it's already causing leadership shifts, you know, in the community. And invariably, the, the, the Orang Asli will be like no other community in Malaysia, you know, devout of the identity and with young children totally forgetting the roots. Historically and in, by experience, you know that from other communities in the, in the world, you know, uh, Australian Aborigines, for example, Native Americans, whenever they've lost touch with the community, whenever they're uh, unable to have a hook on their identity, there's a lot of social problems uh, they encounter, including drink, especially drink. It all relates to not knowing who you are or where you come from. It's very important. I would call it genocide, but I guess it's too harsh a word. Ethnocide is, is, is more specific and uh, not, not as you know, harsh a description, but it is uh, definitely killing them softly. You know? Inda's husband Rasit seems oblivious of the danger he and his people face. In the timeless forest, change is marked by the turning of the seasons. Here, Rasid is harvesting jering, a jungle fruit that will provide both food and cash for his family. The jungle is familiar, and Rasid feels connected to his ancestral roots. But now his way of life is in jeopardy, and a death sentence hangs over the whole tribe. A dam is to be built on the river that flows through his tribal lands to slake the thirst of an increasingly parched urban jungle. And some say to save certain companies from financial ruin. This is where the dam wall will rise. This entire valley will be inundated. The dam wall will be 110 meters high and the lake it spawns will flood 600 hectares of forest that now teems with wildlife. More than 20 species of which are on the endangered list. Hornbills, flying squirrels, lemurs, tapirs, clouded leopards. As news of the dam filtered down to the villagers and they realized that their homes were to be demolished and their ancestors' graves flooded out, they expressed their helpless rage. I say the government wants to suck our lifeblood. They're not looking after us. It's wrong for them to grab our homes. I don't want it. I speak the truth. I don't want to go to a different place. I speak truly. I don't want to leave. I will die here no matter what they do. I'm here and I will stay here. All that the Asli can do now is to warn of the very real dangers. They get angry, angry. Their anger is different from above, like this, black clouds. It's going to rain. A strong wind comes, blown by them, till everything is finished. We hear boom, boom. That's it. The rivers will swell, and the dragon will come down and strike the dam. That's it. That's their kind of anger. There will be nothing left when the dragon comes down.
You wait and see. They don't get angry so easily. We cut all the trees, we ruin the whole forest. Of course they get angry. That's why we say, don't disturb the environment. The Tumuan speak of angry dragons. Scientists prefer to discuss erosion, siltation, ecosystem collapse. It's all the same, really. And in the end, flash floods, landslides, species death, irreversible destruction. In the village, the Orang Asli have found an ally in Antares, who straddles both the mythological and the scientific realms. How much are we going to allow uh, the administration, for example, to, to uh, just use economic you know, uh, arguments, and not even good ones, you know, uh, to push through all kinds of projects that threaten the environment and threaten uh, indigenous cultures? And when do enough people say, stop that, you know, stop that, we can't really, really afford to do that anymore? Thousands of people come to the river every year. Some to cool off, relax, and spend an affordable day out with the family. Others prefer the more rugged challenges of the jungle. The area is already on the ecotourism map. Whitewater rafting is well established, a popular antidote to city stress. Rubin Gunn was one of the first to recognize the area's potential. Personally, I think in Southeast Asia or even Asia, this is the best river there is. It's next to the federal capital. It's only one hour's drive. It's got rapids that are world class. The water is rather clean because we don't have so much logging on top. And there you are. I mean, other places you could drive like five hours, one day just to get there. This is perfect. You come here, enjoy your rafting, go back to Kuala Lumpur. There you go. Good day. Life for some of the Orang Asli has substantially improved since Ruben arrived. Here they are well paid and treated with respect. Ruben employs the Orang Asli as river guides. Their innate knowledge and skills are crucial when navigating the wild rapids. You build a dam, 20 years from now it's all silted up and uh, what do you do after that? So it is not long term if you build a dam. You may call it water supply or whatever, that's pretty short-sighted. But uh, ecotourism, if you leave it to run by itself, like Costa Rica, South Africa, Zambezi, those are long-term stuff. You can do it 100 years from now. I don't, can't say the same for the dam though. It's, it's a shame. Angry citizens and environmental activists formed a powerful anti-dam coalition. The Slangon Dam is also going to be one of a string of uh, very socially destructive and environmentally uh, devastating uh, projects in this country. The people will have to take a stand that we will not allow any more post-colonial colonialism in this country in which the indigenous peoples are the victims. As far as the campaign is concerned, we call on the people, not only in the Klang Valley, but in the whole country, to support this campaign because we think that this is the last straw. The coalition confronted the government and presented an alternative water strategy, but encountered nothing but bland excuses and outright dismissal. The Orang Asli warmed to these new guardians of the forest who had become their de facto allies. As for their official protectors, the Department of Orang Asli Affairs, their hands seem tied. Once the state has made it, its decision, it will become, uh, you know, after the event for us to enter. So we came in after the decision we made, and uh, our role, as I mentioned early on, is to get the best package, the best deal for them. Our original land was excellent. This land needs to be fertilized. It's swamp land. It's infertile. Nothing will grow here. Kita pergi lawatan ke kampung yang pernah berlaku projek yang sama kan? We visited a village that has experienced a similar project. We were told by Batin Senin 
that his advice was that the dam project must be opposed as strongly as possible. Don't accept it. He put it this way, we have been hit. And I hope that you and Perta don't get hit like this. All their sweet promises are just sweet promises. What they say is lies. Using a donated computer, Antares has set up a website, taking the battle to the rest of the world. Rainforest uh, protection groups, the people who are into saving the indigenous peoples, these people have become aware of our work and they're networking so that with enough people waking up and saying something, doing something, you know, there is still a lot of hope. Connecting on the cultural level has helped spread the word. Minas group Akar Umbi was invited to perform at the Rainforest World Music Festival in Sarawak, Borneo. It was a chance to meet other indigenous people. To know they are not alone in their struggle for freedom and dignity. It's a joyous mingling of kindred spirits, an expression of solidarity among indigenous cultures, and a celebration of their music. Once again, Minas' haunting voice sang the songs of her ancestors to a new world. And that world responded with an outpouring of wild enthusiasm. But for Mina, there wouldn't be a next year. Three weeks after the Rainforest Festival, she died. Mina Angung would not live to see her trees felled, her ancestral lands drowned beneath rising dam waters, her family uprooted and displaced. For a lifelong guardian of the forest, that was perhaps a small mercy.
sungguh ikirma 